Welcome. This is the one year Bible reading for January 26th. We started Exodus yesterday, right as a continuation of Genesis, which is appropriate. Um, my commentary says that Exodus begins with the Hebrew uh, word and to show that it is a continuation of Genesis. Um, but let me give you the background for Exodus. After nearly 400 years of growth in Egypt, the infant nation Israel is now ready to leave behind the chains of slavery and seek a new homeland. Exodus narrates the liberation of Israel from Egyptian captivity and the migration of God's new nation to the wilderness of Sinai. Moses, the great deliverer, announces 10 devastating plagues of judgment upon Egypt, then leads the Israelites on the first leg of their journey to the promised land. So the first 18 chapters relate to Israel's exodus from bondage in Egypt, while the last chapters record the instructions given by God on Mount Sinai to direct the life and the worship of the nation. So we're beginning today in chapter 2, verse 11. Many years later, when Moses had grown up, he went out to visit his own people, the Hebrews, and he saw how hard they were forced to work. During his visit, he saw an Egyptian beating one of his fellow Hebrews. After looking in all directions to make sure that no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. The next day, when Moses went out to visit his people again, he saw two Hebrew men fighting. Why are you beating up your friend? Moses said to the one who had started the fight. The man replied, who appointed you to be our priest and judge? Are you going to kill me as you killed that Egyptian yesterday? Then Moses was afraid, thinking, everyone knows what I did. And sure enough, Pharaoh heard what had happened, and he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in the land of Midian. When Moses arrived in Midian, he sat down beside a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters who came as usual to draw water and fill the water troughs for their father's flocks. But some other shepherds came and chased them away. So Moses jumped up and rescued the girls from the shepherds. Then he drew water for their flocks. When the girls returned to Reuel, their father, he asked, Why are you back so soon today? An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds, they answered. And then he drew water for us and watered our flocks. Then where is he? Their father asked. Why did you leave him there? Invite him to come and eat with us. Moses accepted the invitation and he settled there with him. In time, Raoul gave Moses his daughter Zipporah to be his wife. Later, she gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, for he explained, I have been a foreigner in a foreign land. Years passed, and the king of Egypt died, but the Israelites continued to groan under the burden of slavery. They cried out for help, and their cry rose up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He looked down on the people of Israel and knew it was time to act. One day, Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a burning fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go and see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of my people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. 
Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people, Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God, Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you. And this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. But Moses protested, If I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, What is his name? Then what should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. Now go and call together all the elders of Israel. Tell them the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me. He told me, I have been watching closely, and I see how the Egyptians are treating you. I have promised to rescue you from your oppression in Egypt. I will lead you to a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. The elders of Israel will accept your message. Then you and the elders must go to the king of Egypt and tell him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. So please let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand forces him. So I will raise my hand and strike the Egyptians, performing all kinds of miracles among them. Then at last he will let you go. And I will cause the Egyptians to look favorably upon you. They will give you gifts when you go, so you will not leave empty-handed. Every Israelite woman will ask for articles of silver and gold and fine clothing from her Egyptian neighbors and from the foreign women in their houses. You will dress your sons and daughters with these, stripping the Egyptians of their wealth. Matthew chapter 17, starting in verse 10. Then his disciples asked him, Why do the teachers of religious law insist that Elijah must return before the Messiah comes? Jesus replied, Elijah in, is indeed coming first to get everything ready. But I tell you, Elijah has already come, but he wasn't recognized, and they chose to abuse him. And in the same way, they will also make the Son of Man suffer. Then the disciples realized that he was talking about John the Baptist. At the foot of the mountain, a large crowd was waiting for them. A man came and knelt before Jesus and said, Lord, have mercy on my son. He often falls into the water or, or fire. So I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. Jesus said, you faithless and corrupt people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Then Jesus rebuked the demon and the boy and it left him. From that moment, the boy was well. Afterward, the disciples asked Jesus privately, Why couldn't we cast out that demon? You don't have enough faith, Jesus told them. I tell you the truth, if you had faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. After they gathered again in Galilee, Jesus told them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of his enemies. He will be killed, but on the third day he will be raised from the dead. And the disciples were filled with grief. On their arrival in Capernaum, the collectors of the temple tax came to Peter and asked him, Doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, Peter replied. Then he went into the house, but before he had a chance to speak, Jesus asked him, What do you think, Peter? Do kings tax their own people or the people they have conquered? They tax the people they have conquered, Peter replied. Well then, Jesus said, the citizens are free. However, we don't want to offend them, so go down to the lake and throw in a line. Open the mouth of the first fish you catch and you will find a large silver coin, Take it and pay the tax for both of us. 
I was reading today that this uh, account is only mentioned in Matthew, which is perhaps appropriate because Matthew was a tax collector. Psalm 22, a Psalm of David. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far away when I groan for help? Every day I call to you, my God, but you do not answer. Every night you hear my voice, but I find no relief. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. Our ancestors trusted in you, and you rescued them. They cried out to you and were saved. They trusted in you and were never disgraced. But I am a worm and not a man. I am scorned and despised by all. Everyone who sees me mocks me. They sneer and shake their heads, saying, Is this the one who relies on the Lord? Then let the Lord save him. If the Lord loves him so much, let the Lord rescue him. Yet you brought me safely from my mother's womb and led me to trust you at my mother's breast. I was thrust into your arms at birth. You have been my God from the moment I was born. Do not stay so far from me, for trouble is near, and no one else can help me. My enemies surround me like a herd of bulls. Fierce bulls of Bashan have hemmed me in. Like lions, they open their jaws against me, roaring and tearing into their prey. My life is poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax melting within me. My strength is dried up like sun-baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You have laid me in the dust and left me for dead. My enemies surround me like a pack of dogs. An evil gang closes in on me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. My enemies stare at me and gloat. They divide my garments among themselves and throw dice for my clothing. Proverbs 5, starting in verse 7 through 14. So now, my sons, listen to me. Never stray from what I am about to say. Stay away from her. Don't go near the door of her house. Now, if we remember, we've been talking about the immoral woman. If you do, you will lose your honor and will lose to merciless people all you have achieved. Strangers will consume your wealth and someone else will enjoy the fruit of your labor. In the end, you will groan in anguish when disease consumes your body. You will say, how I hated discipline. If only I had not ignored all the warnings. Oh, why didn't I listen to my teachers? Why didn't I pay attention to my instructors? I have come to the brink of utter ruin and now I must face public disgrace. To end today, I have back in Selwyn Hughes. Um, we are with Psalm 127, just starting this new Psalm of Ascent, this section called Don't Work in Vain. A subject on which most people have strong views is that of work. Those who are out of work or cannot work because of some injury or disability find this subject a distressing one. Those who have work and enjoy what they do find it deeply rewarding and fulfilling. There is a minority who, while they like the thought of financial reward, are not so keen to make the effort necessary to earn that reward. The theme of Psalm 127 is, as you have guessed, work. It puts the whole subject into clear spiritual focus. Work is a major component of our lives. It is the one area of life, perhaps above all others, where, as Eugene Peterson has put it, our sin can be magnified or our faith mature. The ancient Israelites saw work in the same light that they saw worship. To them, there was no difference between the sacred and the secular. Everything they did under the eye of God and each activity had to square with the divine will. Unless the Lord builds the house, unless the Lord watches over the city, all is in vain. Note the word unless. It presupposes that God works also. He builds. He watches. Because of that, unless we link everything we do to him, then it will be in vain. I really mean that. A house can be built by human hands, but it can only become a home when God is in it. God must be at work in our work. Otherwise, our work is in vain. 
Father, we remember what your son said when he was on earth. My father is always at his work, and I too am working. John 5, 17. Show us how to link our work with your work so that what we do becomes a natural, inevitable, faithful development of your work. Amen. I hope you can have joy in your work today, whatever that is. Love you all. Have a beautiful day.